This week on the West Block. Two Canadians who have been detained in China for 18 months have now been charged with spying. The two Michaels charged and a failed UN bid. The C on the Security Council was never an end in itself. It was merely a mean to an end. It's true. I called him a racist. Allegations of racism in Parliament. We had a motion to call out the systemic racism in RCMP. Anyone who wants to vote against that is a racist, yes. And that à l'intérieur is anything but a racist person. This is the second of our official debates and the conservative leadership debate. Uh, we uh, have continued to express our uh, disappointment uh, with the Chinese decision, with the Chinese uh, detention of these two Canadians. We will continue to advocate uh, for their release, for their return to Canada, uh, while highlighting, of course, uh, that uh, we, uh, we have an independent judicial system. That was the Prime Minister on the news late last week, that two Canadians, Michael Spavor and Michael Kovary, being held in China, have now been charged with espionage, among other charges. Both men have been detained in China since December of 2018. And their arrests came after Huawei executive Meng Wanzhou was arrested in Vancouver. Where does the relationship between the two countries stand, and when might we see some help for the two Michaels? Joining me now to discuss this is Canada's former ambassador to China, David Mulroney. How are you, Mr. Mulroney? Hi, Mercedes. How are you? Very well, thanks. Obviously, we're all thinking of the state that Michael Spavor and Michael Kovrig must be in right now, how they must feel. What was your reaction to China finally laying charges after a year and a half? In a way, uh, we saw this coming. This was inevitable because what China has been doing is uh, a crude parody of the Canadian legal system. At every step in the Meng Wanzhou extradition process, China has followed it with um, a step of its own that is designed to prolong the detention of our two Canadians for at least as long as Ms. Meng is in um, in her judicial process in Canada. So we had the ruling in Canada a couple of weeks ago on double criminality, and the fact that Ms. Meng lost that means that the case will go on at least until next spring. And so, uh, as expected, the Chinese have now announced another step in their process, completely fake, completely spurious which puts our two poor Canadians uh, in the same kind of jeopardy they've been in for so many days, so many hundreds of days, um, for some time. So that, that with the charges, a process begins that could take uh, up to a year or more. It'll take exactly as long as the Chinese Communist Party thinks it needs to take to send us a message and to put pressure on us. Are the charges the message alone, or are Michael Spavor and Michael Kovrig in more danger now because they're closer to a trial and therefore potentially closer to a sentence? In one sense, yes, because technically the Chinese could say, well, you know, we can't do anything now because we have rule of law and we've got to let the court decide. But the reality is that courts decide according to the party. And Michael Spavor and Michael Kovrig will be held exactly as long as the party thinks they need to be held, regardless of the process. So in that sense, things have not changed. But what continues, as you indicated, is this very cruel isolation for two men. Because of the pandemic, uh, they have not had consular visits. Uh, Mr. Kovrig, as we discovered on your show, ha had a call from his father, a single call. Uh, they're living, you know, with the lights on 24-7 in, in crowded cells. They have very little room to walk around, very little to divert themselves. It's a cruel and terrible situation, and it's going to continue for some time. What do you think of the government's response? We heard from the prime minister. Some people have said they need to be tougher on China. Others say that doesn't matter because until Meng Wanzhou is released, this will be the situation. What are your thoughts? I think the prime minister has failed on two counts. He's speaking to two audiences. One audience is China, and he needs to be franker and tougher and more honest because the Chinese are watching. If they determine that he will continue to be as um, friendly, uh, as careful in his use of language as he has been, there's no cost to them. Uh, they know that they have him where they want, want him, and they, they'll continue to put pressure on us. The other message, though, is Canadians. Canadians need to hear that the prime minister is deeply concerned, that he's outraged about what's happening to our Canadian, to our, our two Canadian citizens. 
Uh, one of the Canadian sub audiences is, of course, the Public Service of Canada, but the Foreign Service. When they hear the Prime Minister speaking like that, they get the message that it's kid gloves, that we don't want to rock the boat, that we don't want to change anything, that we're trying to get back to the status quo. So he needs to change his language, not in an, un in an unreasonable way or in a way that, that seeks to provoke the Chinese, but that one that is guided by facts and it expresses the concern that Canadians deeply feel. Do you think there's value in some kind of economic retaliation? I don't think retaliation in this sense works simply because the Chinese system is so different. They can take a lot more pain than we can. And what retaliation means is that some Canadian sectors will be targeted. And that's, you know, we have a democracy and we have to care about all of our Canadian citizens. But there are some very real practical steps that we could and should be taking that we haven't, that have nothing to do with a retaliation and everything to do with taking care of our Canadians. If we look at it now, we've had more than a year of detention, of this outrageous detention, yet we continue to pump trade missions and academic exchanges and cultural programs in, into China. If any other country had done this, we would have curtailed that. So the first thing we should be doing is cutting back on all of this government-sponsored or government-directed travel. We should be ensuring that Canadians hear loud and clear how dangerous China can be for them and how limited our options are. And we should be working with the like-minded to come up with a common uh, travel advisory, common language that expresses the danger. I think the Australians who've experienced this would be interested in joining us. The Swedes are going through this. This could be a powerful response to China, and it's one that's entirely in line with what the government should be doing. Another major uh, foreign policy hit for Canada this week, the loss of the bid for a UN Security Council seat. Uh, this is a government that came to power in 2015, saying Canada's back. They were convinced that they could get the seat. They poured millions of dollars into pursuing it. They were not able to get it. Why do you think that is, and what do you think it says about Canadian foreign policy? When you think about it, Mercedes, this week has brought us the defeat in New York on Wednesday, and then back on Friday we discovered what was happening to the two Michaels, that their, their, the charges were being brought against them. In many ways, it's one of the most disastrous weeks for foreign policy, Canadian foreign policy, in, in recent memory. We now have had, I think we've witnessed the death of one particular form of Canadian foreign policy, such as it was with the Security Council defeat. The world apparently has decided that it actually does not need more Canada. We should take that lesson and recognize that that was a 1970s or 80s diplomacy at best. Time to move on from that old form of multilateralism. At the same time, the Chinese are reminding us that the world is much more dangerous for us, much colder, and that we need to invest in our own security and pushing back against Chinese interference uh, at home. And we need to be working with allies to try to limit and push back against Chinese uh, interference in other countries and efforts to undermine the system, the rule, uh, system of rules that Canada and others have put in place. So it's been a disastrous week, but sometimes you can move on from a disaster. I would suggest that the government not be too ambitious. They don't need to remake everything. They should start with getting China policy right, getting the language right, and taking the steps that Canadians have been waiting for them to take. An important discussion, no doubt. We appreciate your expertise and your time. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Mulroney. Thank you, Mercedes. Up next, systemic racism in Canada. What is the government doing to end it? We'll ask the only Indigenous cabinet minister in Justin Trudeau's cabinet. Welcome back. Systemic racism in Canada. Northern Affairs Minister Dan Vandell told colleagues on the Hill last week that he was revolted by recent videotape showing police brutality against Indigenous people. Vandell is the only Indigenous cabinet minister and one of four Liberal MPs from the Prairies. What does he want his government to do to end systemic racism in this country? Joining me now to discuss that is the minister himself. Uh, minister, you have a unique role in that you represent Canada. Canada's North. You also bring a unique perspective to the table as the only Indigenous cabinet minister. What do you think your government should be doing? Well, first of all, I, I, I don't know many, I don't know any Canadians that were not uh, revolted by the videos, the many videos that are coming from 
from all different parts of Canada, whether it's the north or the Atlantic provinces or Alberta. It's something that is completely unacceptable and it's something that needs to stop ASAP. I think uh, when I spoke at the committee a few uh, days ago, I was a little frustrated because uh, uh, we, we do have, this is an issue that's not new. This is an issue when I first got into municipal politics in the late eighties, we had something in Winnipeg called the Aboriginal Justice Inquiry where uh, which was launched because uh, a First Nations man was uh, was shot by by the police uh, in uh, in in an inner city of Winnipeg and uh, unjustly, of course. And there was a whole inquiry, and uh, Murray Sinclair presided over it. And there was a, a quite a quite a, a thick book of recommendations on what municipal governments and governments generally and societies should do to kind of bridge that divide. Since then, we've had the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples. We've had uh, the, uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Committee with many calls to justice, the Missing and Murdered Indigenous, uh, Indigenous Women and Girls Report. Uh, I, I think we have a basic roadmap. Government has a basic roadmap in front of us through the many reports and recommendations that have been already been commissioned. We need to go back to those reports and we need to make sure that uh, those calls to action are implemented and that's something incidentally our government is doing but uh, we we need to we need to put uh, added vigor into that exercise minister there's been a lot of criticism from very prominent indigenous leaders including perry bellegarde cindy blackstock the native women's association saying the government has made promises on everything from schools for indigenous children to indigenous policing to not having responded yet to the missing and murdered indigenous women's report so a lot of work there that the government has committed to but hasn't done yet but i just want to turn our attention to, to parliament hill because uh, this week as you know jagmeet singh called the bloc quebecois House leader, a racist in the House, over a motion he made with his hand when he turned down uh, Mr. Singh's motion uh, on the RCMP and on systemic racism in Canada that he wanted to have debated. Do you believe that that motion and that tone that the bloc leader took was racist? You know, I wasn't there in the House that day, and I, I would have to let the bloc uh, speak for themselves on why they decided uh, to oppose that motion. I know our government supported it. It's something that uh, that certainly needs to be done, and uh, when 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 the only racialized leader like Jagmeet Singh uh, makes that sort of comment, uh, I respect that comment, and uh, and and I, and I think uh, all Canadians should as well. Uh, uh, I don't know what uh, Mr. Singh's lived experience is, but obviously he's describing what his lived experience is, and I I, I respect what he said. Getting back to your, your other comment about our government hasn't done enough, I'm for sure agree with you, we haven't done enough, but we've spent more than any other government in recent history on trying to eliminate the, the, uh, uh, the social inequities that Indigenous nations live in. Uh, I know that we've spent $25 billion of new money on education, on justice, on health, but that's not enough. We have to continue that sort of investment in, in nations uh, across the uh, uh, the country for a prolonged period of time. Well, Minister, what's well, the question I wanted to ask you because Mr. Singh said that he believes people who deny the existence of systemic racism are in fact racist themselves. Do you agree with that assessment? I, I think if you refuse to uh, if you refuse to acknowledge that systemic racism exists, uh, you you are you certainly do not have an open mind to to address this issue and uh, and and I think by certainly refusing to acknowledge that systemic racism exists you are exhibiting uh, racist behavior I mean it's uh, it, it's it's hard to argue with that I mean uh, it's it's I I think we, we need to get we need to get beyond that to solutions on how we actually address the systemic racism and the racism that uh, that, that is existent in Canada in, in 2020. And uh, we need to look at very specific uh, uh, issues that are going to uh, improve the situation. I'll give you an example. Uh, this morning before this interview, I was at a round table on the use of uh, body cameras in Nunavut and in the North. It was a, a great uh, conversation. There was uh, members of the RCMP there, there were senators, there were uh, Inuit leaders, 
There was uh, some 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 politicians from the north, and uh, we just had a very frank discussion on on is this uh, reality? Is this somewhere we want to go down? Those sorts of of conversations have to occur across Canada on a multitude of issues. A very important conversation and one we look forward to continuing with you in the future. Thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Coming up, we'll hear from former Bloc Québécois leader Gilles Doucet on the events over this past week on Parliament Hill and accusations of racism against a BQ member. Welcome back. A showdown in the House of Commons last week, dramatic moments as NDP leader Jagmeet Singh was kicked out for calling the Bloc Québécois House leader a racist for not supporting his motion on systemic racism in the RCMP in Canada. The Bloc wants action if Singh refuses to apologize, and so far it looks like that is the case. So how is all of this playing out in Quebec? Joining me now is former Bloc Québécois leader and political analyst Gilles Duceppe. How are you, Mr. Duceppe? Pretty well. I mean, come fine, but well. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. We want to talk to you today about this dynamic on Parliament Hill. What is your take when you were watching this all go down last week, uh, and how is this playing for the Bloc in Quebec? Well, I, I was very surprised of uh, Jack Singh's reaction, because the Bloc supported a motion that was adopted unanimously by the House to hold a meeting of a committee to study racism within the RCMP. So we supported that. Uh, the leader, Mr. Blanchet, made a speech uh, recognizing the existence of uh, systematic racism. And the Bloc said we shouldn't uh, uh, adopt the new motion proposed by the NDP because that means coming to conclusion before hearing people next week in Ottawa, because witnesses will come in Ottawa to discuss the question of uh, uh, systematic racism in the RCMP. So that was the only reason. So I don't understand at all Jagmeet Singh calling the Tellier a racist. And in Quebec, I think it's not supported at all, but the NDP is almost absent in Quebec nowadays. And uh, I think Trudeau made an error also saying that uh, he, he's understanding, he doesn't understand the bloc uh, having that attitude. I think that was a rational and logical attitude. We can't make conclusion before hearing the witnesses or if we want to adopt such a motion, we shouldn't call to the, the committee to have a meeting discussing uh, uh, systematic racism in the RCMP. It's one or the other, not both of them, of course. Uh, Jagmeet Singh is saying that it's racist, that the, the motion that Thirian made was racist uh, with his hand, and that the refusal to even allow this motion that he was proposing to get to a debate denies systemic racism, and anyone who denies systemic racism is therefore a racist. So I'm taking it that you but disagree he, with Mr. That Singh was, on that. That was pure hypocrisy, and he was lying, because the Bloc supported the motion to discuss the systematic racism in the RCMP, and Blanche made a speech saying that he recognized the existence of systematic racism. I think that uh, Singh, all, the only thing he wanted to do was to get more support in the rest of Canada, uh, uh, knowing that he's losing to the Liberals, uh, even in D.C. So um, I think that was cheap politics from uh, Jagmeet Singh. It won't help them in Quebec, not at all, and neither Trudeau, by the way. So you don't think the, the emotion he had at the press conference or what he was saying was genuine? Well, I mean, I don't know if it was genuine or not, but it was plain stupid, that I'm sure. And when a party recognized the existence of systematic racism, uh, Sagan in a motion to call a committee holding a meeting and hearing witnesses on systematic racism, I mean, and uh, the leader of the party recognizing himself the existence of systematic racism, it was only a question of uh, to be logical. I mean, if you call a, a, ask a committee to study that question, calling witnesses and go to the conclusion before hearing the witnesses, it's not 
showing a, a deep respect for the witnesses that will come in Ottawa this summer. Premier Legault has also said he doesn't believe there is systemic racism in Quebec. Do you think that there is a problem with recognizing systemic racism in Quebec society? Uh, there's sy systematic racism all over in the world, including Canada. And I do remember Justin Trudeau in 2006, when there was a meeting to support Katsimarik in with uh, Senator Hebert. And Trudeau came to me and asked me, What's your, what is your small nation? That was kind of systematic racism. So there is systematic racism in Quebec, but we certainly not have to take lesson from the rest of Canada. Remember pronouncing a speech in Saskatoon University in Saskatoon in 1991. And uh, there was a lot of students criticizing Quebec because there's a sovereignist movement and for them it's racism. And uh, uh, I, I said, well, in, in Quebec, the First Nations are 1% of the population, but 2% of the population in jail, this is unacceptable. So they were applauding. And then I said, I checked in Saskatchewan this morning, 12% of the population, but 72% of the population in jail. They all went back to their seats. I said, come on, there's no more questions. What's the problem? I mean, we have to recognize their systematic racism all over the place. But when Canada's trying to give lesson to Quebec, I mean, just unacceptable that they, the Francophones outside Quebec will have the same rights and the Anglophones in Quebec, they'll be very happy. It's not the case at all. One last question I wanted to ask you, but on a different topic, Monsieur Ducep, we saw the conservative debate earlier this week, both in French and in English. One of the big discussions has been that the candidates are not that fluent in French. Who do you think should lead the party, and do you think any of them have good enough French to make an impression in Quebec? I would say the night of the debate in French, uh, my wife and I said, uh, do we listen to a, a special program on uh, uh, politic uh, analysis around the world or listen to a comedy. So we chose to listen to the comedy. That was the debate in French. I mean, 50 years after the adoption of the Official Languages Act in Canada, those people just can't speak French. I mean, I just don't understand that. And, and I think both of them, it be O'Toole or McKay, uh, both of them uh, are speaking a, a, a French, which is worse than Andrew Shear. Having said that, you said that I said that, I said the essential. I, I think I, I don't see how how they'll be able to make a campaign in in Quebec next time around. Monsieur Dusap, we appreciate your analysis. Thank you for joining us today. It was a pleasure. And that is all the time that we have for today. Thank you for joining us. And to all the dads out there, including my own dad, happy Father's Day. We'll see you next week.